Welcome to everyone out there. Thank you for joining us for an exciting conversation about the future of space exploration. And I don't even mean that in the science fiction sort of way when we talk about space exploration. Uh, we are actually about to meet two people who are literally the future of human space travel. Uh, this is going to be a conversation about science and space, but also about something much closer to home. It's our own curious human nature. What draws simple human beings to the stars? What drives the absurd notion that we could escape the pull of our home planet? Uh, and can hard work actually be fun work? I'm Jeff Jones. I'm an editor and producer for the Public Insight Network here at American Public Media in St. Paul, Minnesota, where there is still snow on the ground outside my window. Uh, and I want to introduce you to our guests. Just across town in Minneapolis is Abigail Harrison, an aspiring astronaut who you may know better as Astronaut Abby. Uh, Abby, how you doing? Tell us where you are and uh, tell us how old you are. Um, hi, Jeff. Uh... I'm 15 years old, and I'm also in Minneapolis. Well, I'm in Minnesota as well. I'm across the river in Minneapolis. So. Very good. And Abby, where do you go to school? I'm at school at Minneapolis South High. Thank you very much for taking time to, uh, to join us today. And I'm going to introduce someone who you know very well, um, and we're going to talk in a minute about how you guys met. But uh, Lu uh, Luca Parmitano is an astronaut with the European Space Agency, and he is currently preparing for his first trip into space. Luca, I want to welcome you. Uh, tell us where you are today and what you've been up to. Well, first of all, thank you for, for having me today. I want to say hello to everybody who's listening. Uh, I'm in Star City, which is a small town right outside Moscow in Russia. And I am in my flight suit because I actually just walked out uh, less than an hour ago out of a sim uh, simulator that I've been working on the whole day. Um. On May 28th, Luca and uh, two of your colleagues, correct, are going to blast off for a six-month stay in the International Space Station. Uh, and Luca, you're the flight engineer for that mission, right? That is correct. As a matter of fact, anybody who's not the commander is a flight engineer. Uh, but on the Soyuz spacecraft, we, we call the Soyuz the flight engineer number one is actually the, the co-pilot of the, of the spacecraft. So we have a commander who sits in the center seat. We have a uh, uh, flight engineer number two sits on the right and has uh, very little interaction with, uh, with, those, with the initial phases of flight. And then we have a flight engineer number one, that would be me, and I'm sort of the co-pilot for the, for the spacecraft. Right. Um, first, I want to say a word to our audience here. We invite you uh, to ask us questions. If you're viewing this Hangout Live at sciencenightmn.tumblr.com, you'll see a Scribble Live chat box where you can add your questions for Abby and Luca. We've already had a bunch of great questions come in from our Public Insight Network, uh, and I hope all of you will consider signing up to be sources for journalists who write about science and every other topic you can imagine about. We need to know your expertise and your questions. So uh, sign up at... Uh, publicinsightnetwork.org. And now to our guests, uh, and I just want to start with a question from a group of people who I think are watching us right now. Mrs. Fine's fifth grade class in Arlington, Virginia, um, found out about this, and they are, gonna, they are asking the key question, and I'm going to put this to Abby first. Abby, why? Why, why do you want to be an astronaut? Um, that's a really good question, Jeff, and also Mrs. Fine's fifth graders. Um, I think that I want to be an astronaut because I've always wanted to travel in space. It's really the curiosity that pulls me, that draw of we don't know what's out there. There's so much to be discovered and done, and um, space is the platform to begin discovering that. Luca, who inspired you uh, or what event in your life inspired you to become an astronaut? So I, uh, I'm 36 years old, so I grew up when, uh, in the beginning of the 80s, when the first space shuttles uh, flights were, were happening. And uh, I remember that even in Italy, uh, they were broadcasting the, 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 those flights, those initial, initial flights. And I think that as a kid watching the, the early astronauts doing their first spacewalks and going to space and then coming back, and making it look like such a neat thing. I think it, it inspired me. It, I, I believe that seeing that the image in my eyes uh, really uh, made an impression. Uh, plus, uh, even though I didn't witness it, um, 
the, the moon landing uh, it sort of stayed uh, in, in the collective memory of people uh, through pictures, movies, uh, and posters. And so I just always thought that that would be something that I, that I would love to do, uh, being an astronaut and being able to do the same things. David Wilson, uh, Wilton in Seattle, Washington, wants to know, uh, do, you, do either of you have a particular love for the, the STEM fields? What is that? Uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Is there, is there one of the scientific fields that really captures your imagination? And, and again, I'll post that to Abby first. Um, I'd say within the STEM fields, I'm the biggest fan of science. While I love science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, science is the one that I'm really the most interested in. And even farther than that, my favorite scientific subjects are biology and geology. Um, but like I said, I do really enjoy math as well. And uh, what do you love about the uh, biology and the geology? Um, in biology, I was really captured by the idea of this is the process that uh, it, it shows the processes uh, that allow life to occur. That's what really captured me was um, understanding what we are made of, the fundamentals of the human race and all of the physical environment around us. Um, and with geology, it was, again, that same idea of the physical environment around me, where I was um, mystified by uh, the Earth and how it became this way, what happened to make it this way. Luca, uh, are those things, is science, uh, geology, biology, are those going to be useful to Abby as she tries to become an astronaut? Everything is going to be useful. Anything, anything that you love is, is going to be useful. Uh, anything that, that makes you do well, anything that makes you curious, uh, and in general, anything related to science, to all, all those subjects of, of the STEM, you know, engineering, technology, uh, science. Science to me is exploration. Uh, they, they go, uh, the reason why we explore is to, to know more, and science is all about knowing and, and finding out answers. So those two, two things are one and the same to me. And of course, math is just, it's the basis for everything we do. So, uh, but, but certainly, certainly uh, she, she picked two sciences that are, that are cert certainly interesting and will be even more so in the future where uh, geology or geophysics are, uh, is a field where there is, there is so much to discover. And uh, biology is the, uh, one of the sciences that, that we, uh, for which we do most a lot of research on the on the session. We do a lot of physiology, which is a branch of of biology. So uh, certainly, she picked. Uh, she she has the right taste for uh, for her future career. So, Luca, what were you doing today in the uh, in the Soyuz capsule where you were training that involved science or math or biology or any of these things we've been talking about? Well, the Soyuz is, is just the way we get to the station and back from the station. It's a, very, it's a small spacecraft. So uh, we don't really, although I'll, I'll really do science, although I'll come back to that in a second. To what, what we were doing today, uh, we had a six-hour-long six simulation where we, uh, where, uh, we simulated getting in the spacecraft and then launch, launching, getting into orbit, and then... Uh, Within four revolutions around the Earth, that takes about six hours, we, we docked to the station. And uh, in this specific scene, we had to solve a series of emergency situations that, where we had to uh, make sure that, that we uh, were safely keeping uh, the spacecraft on track and that we were also saving ourselves. And, um, and that's, what, that's what we trained. Earlier on, we were saying that they trained me to uh, inspect the unexpected. That, that, is, that is one of the way. Uh, we, we, we prepare ourselves is by running uh, endless simulations, trying to figure out what, can, what could possibly kill us and, and figure out a way not to get killed. Uh, and going back to the science, it is, it is true that uh, usually the spacecraft, the soil is just a way to get to the station where we actually do the science with our job. However, on the way there, I will have in my pocket a questionnaire about space headaches. And so... If I do have, if I, if I, for some reason I get a headache while I'm, while I'm on my way to the station, I pull out the questionnaire, fill it up, say how it started, what kind of headache I had, and then that will be used by scientists on the ground to study headaches in orbit. So, as you're going up 
into space in one of the most high-tech inventions ever created, you're going to have a pen and paper in your pocket so that you can submit a questionnaire when you get back? Almost correct. I'll have uh, uh, paper and pencils. Pencils? Why? Pencils, not pens? Pencils, not pens, yes. They, uh, pencils are a lot more re reliable. Uh, I, I want to go back to the inspiration around this. Abby, is there a moment that you remember where it all clicked for you? Uh, when you decided, uh, yep, space is where I want to go and astronaut is what I want to be? Um, I'm not sure if there was a specific moment because I've just, this is something that I've always wanted to do since I was a kid, so I can't really say there was a specific moment, but I think meeting Luca was really a time that helped it become more of a real dream. It was always something that was there for me. But meeting Luca, having meeting an astronaut who had actually made it that far, who actually took an interest in what I was doing and said, yes, you can do this, was one of those moments where I went, oh, yes, I can do this. This, is a, this could happen. Okay. At that moment, you guys met sort of by chance in an airport, as I understand it. When you met Abby for the first time, uh, what struck her about, or what struck you about her and her interests? It's, it's very simple. I, 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 I like, uh, like passion in people, any kind of passion, any kind of, of interest, in anything that keeps you going, anything that keeps you inspired. It doesn't have to be, uh, it doesn't have to be a dream of becoming an astronaut. It, it can be anything. And I like I like people that have a passion because those people are usually happy. They are motivated. They they smile a lot, and you know they have a, a sort of a positive attitude towards the future. And so uh, I kind of saw a lot of myself in in, in Abby uh, uh, as a kid growing up. I I had the dream, and I had several. I had many different dreams. A lot of them I, I wasn't able to realize, and uh, but I, I kept dreaming about it and kept uh, you know kept them sort of in, in my in my little pocket, ready ready to pull them out and say, hey, they're still there. And I, I think I saw that in Abby and thought, let's let's talk to this girl and I think I think we can we can come up with something cool. So uh, so what's your advice to someone like uh, Ender Craig who is watching us? He's nine years old and he sent us this question, what can I do now at, at age nine uh, to work towards becoming an astronaut? Is there something about that passion that you're talking about? Um, I think I think Abby can actually answer the question because we we, be, we talked about this. Uh, she asked me the same question, and I only have one only have one advice to give people: don't uh, no, no matter what your age is, you can be you can be five, you can be nine, you can be fifteen. Uh, I don't think you should you should try to think what is a field that will let me uh, become an astronaut, uh, even if that's your ultimate dream. Uh, my suggestion would be to, to do something that you really like, to study the subjects that you like, to do well in school. And as long as you're a student, you, you don't have a choice. You just have to do well in school. And then once you're done with school and you're, and you're picking a field in which to work, pick, pick the field that you like the best. Uh, picking that, it, it, will, it will make sure that, that you do well because if, if, you, if you love it, you will do it well. If you do well, you love it. So it's, it's a sort of this positive circle. And... And, and that's what, what makes dreams come true, is when, when you're really good at what you do, then you will be able to impress people. And who knows in the future what kind of people will need to become astronauts. So uh, let's, let's, not, let's not think about right now. Right now, yes, we select astronauts that are mostly, uh, we have a lot of pilots, we have engineers, we have scientists, we have uh, doctors and, and, and teachers. We have a small percentage of teachers. But in the future, when we're talking about exploration, interplanetary exploration. We will need all kinds of people. We will need builders. We will need biologists. We will need uh, workers that to, to go there and, and sweat and, and build things. And so, so maybe, maybe you will be that kid that 20, 30 years from now, maybe it's not a scientist, but it's somebody with a, with a very cool job that is, that is needed, and, and you'll be able to go to Mars with Abby and build that, that settlement up, up, on, up on Mars. So uh, as long as you're good at what you do, as long as you do really well, that, that, that should be the, the, the career to pursue. Abby, do you have one specific piece of advice for, uh, for, for kids uh, who are interested in space travel? What's one thing they can do now, uh, you know, even when they got to spend all day long at school? <laughs> 
Well, I think that what I would say would actually play on the comment you made that it's not about spending all day long at school. One thing you can do as a kid is to look for those things in school that interest you and really get you passionate because there's no point in being at school if it's just going to be a drag the entire day, but you have to be there anyways. So what you can do now is that you can find things that make it interesting or create your own interesting opportunities while you're at school. If you have an opportunity to choose your own topic for a project that you're doing in class, or even if you don't have that opportunity and you ask your teacher if you can, that can often, then you can choose something you're interested in to learn about, um, which is a lot of what I did in school. And that turns it into something that's less of a chore and more of a, a boon to you where you can start to actually benefit from being in school. And like Lucas said, the more you enjoy something, the more you're going to get out of it, the better job you're going to do. So if you really want to make the most of your schooling, which is important for any job you do in the future, but especially if you want to become an astronaut, um, I'd say just find ways to enjoy what you do so that you can work hard. And, and if I can, I'm going to pick on something that, that, that Abby said that kind of resonates with, uh, with something, something else that I'd like to say, that um, in a way there are, there are only two ways to do something. You can do it well or not. And when I say do it well, it doesn't mean that, that the result needs to be excellent or something, but it's how much effort you put into it. So uh, kids, they, they have to go to school. They really don't have a choice. So, but the choice is whether they want to do it well or not. If they put effort into, into going to school while they're in school, uh, they will get a lot more out of it, and, and certainly they will pay off later. So I want to talk a little bit more about the training that uh, it'll take to become an astronaut for you, Abby. Uh, but first, I want to zoom into some super specific stuff. People are wondering, uh, what are you, exactly are you going to be doing and studying on the International Space Station? Or what's one example of a project, Luca, that you will do when you are living in space for six months? Wow. Uh, so at any given moment on the space station, we have about 150 experiments running. Uh, so during my increment, we have about that number, and we as astronauts interact uh, with about two-thirds of those. So about 100, 120 experiments that, that I would personally interact one way or another. Now, some experiments that uh, we, we just install or uninstall or, or set up, and then they run automatically. Others, we have a lot more interaction. Uh, there, are, there are a few experiments that I, that I kind of took to heart, because maybe because they start with my increment or because I find them fascinating. Uh, there is one that to me uh, kind of uh, comprises all those things that we were talking about. We were talking about innovation, technology, science. Uh, there is an experiment, it's called Green Air. Uh, like green Air? Like green the air. color green? Yeah, the, the color green, Green Air. And it's, uh, I'm sort of uh, proud of it because it happens to be Italian, but that's, that's very secondary. What happens is that on the station, we're going to, to burn uh, biofuels. And the reason why it's called green air is that it's a, it's a green economy sort of experiment where the idea is to, uh, to get away from fossil fuel, uh, uh, fuels and to use these biofuels and to minimize the, the toxics release that happen during combustion. And uh, I like it for two reasons. One, because it, you know we, we all want to save the world and Maybe if we stop burning uh, fuels uh, that are fossils, we, we can stay, take a step forward to that. And also because it doesn't happen every day that you burn stuff on the station. So I'm kind of excited about doing that. You're going to be deliberately starting fires on the International Space Station. That is, that is correct. And it sounds cool, doesn't it? <laughs> Thanks, Luca. Abby, is there a project that uh, you're aware of, whether it's on the International Space Station or not, that, that you've been following really closely, something going on in space right now that, uh, that gets you excited? Um, there hasn't been currently. I've been pretty busy right now, so I haven't been able to keep up with what's going on on the International Space Station. But I'd say what I'm most excited for about the International Space Station is to be able to um, see what Luke is doing and hear about what he's going to be doing on there. Because like he talked about, there, he's going to have a lot of amazing projects that he's working on. So um, I'm going to have to say I'm not sure right now. <laughs> And how are you going to keep in touch while Luke is in space? Or will you just catch up when he's back? Um, no, we are going to keep in touch while he's in space. Uh, I'm going to be his Earth liaison kind of thing, where 
he'll be, we're going to try and email every day or every couple days with just information and talking about what's going on and sometimes some pictures or whatever. And then I'm going to use that information um, during my educational outreach that I'm doing for six months after his launch to try and um, share everything that he's doing and how cool space is with kids all across the United States. I want to get back to, to some of your plans, Abby. Uh, a few people have asked us this. Louise from Brooklyn, New York, who uh, is almost your age, 14, uh, has asked this, uh, as well as some other folks. They just want to know, how long does it take? So when you're done with, uh, with high school, uh, do you have a clear path towards becoming an astronaut? How long will that take? Is that a few years? Is that a few decades? Um, I'm not sure of the exact time because I know that it's different for everyone. I know that a lot of astronauts in order to get into NASA have to apply multiple times and that they don't accept astronauts every year either. It really depends on where the space program is at at the time where I would be ready for that. The time that I would be ready to start applying would be um, I'm planning on going to college after high school and so I'm hoping to get a master's in either microbiology or geology or maybe both. Um, and then after that, I would start, I'd have to get some field experience, which is another part of that idea of, um, that avidly pursuing one thing, avidly pursuing being an astronaut isn't the best path to take. The best path to take is to go down a road that might take me there, but that's also doing something that I enjoy until the right time comes. So there's nothing really definite just because of the fluid nature of the program right now. So Mrs. Ferletti's second grade class is watching us here and they asked that question, how long does it take? And uh, is the answer, uh, you know, do well in school, graduate, go to college and be passionate about uh, some field, become an expert in something um, and then start applying to the space program. Luca, you're, uh, you, you said that you are 36. Uh, is that relatively young or relatively old to be uh, making a space trip? I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> uh, um, so if, if I'm not wrong, I am one of the youngest uh, astronauts to, to fly on the space station for a six-month increment. Uh, some of the Russian colleagues may be younger, but I believe that for the Westerners, I'm one of the youngest. Uh, so if you're so in second I'm, grade right now, uh, you may have to wait until you're, you know, Older than 30, but you got a lot of hard work to do between now and then. Although, uh, you, uh, you can be selected uh, younger. Than, I, I was 33 when I was selected. So, uh, but it, it, it does take a, lot, a long time. And, and let's, let's see why it takes so, so much time. Uh, first of all, you, you, know, you, you, need to, you need to pick a field and you know, go to school and finish your, your general education. And, and, then you, and then you go ahead and you start working. Well, you, you need to get some experience in, in, in the field that, 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 that you are in in order to first understand that that's what you want to do, then to prove to, to yourself and to other people that, that you're really good at it. And then uh, you need to be at the right moment where a selection comes up and, and you apply and you go through the selection process, which already just the selection process started, lasts about a year. So, so it, it, it's a lengthy process because, you know, a lot of people want to do it. There are not, not so many spots. And, and, and you need, you need the background and experience before, before you're actually uh, ready, ready to do it. So in, in my case, I, I was very lucky. Uh, in, in Europe, uh, the last selection before mine was 16 years before. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I applied in 2008 when I was uh, 30, 31. I was selected by the time I was 32. And the previous time that I could apply, I was 16. So, uh, uh, Sometimes, you know, uh, being a U.S. citizen is a lot, is actually gives a lot more opportunities. So, well, that's uh, an interesting point, Luca, that I wanted to talk about. So, uh, you are Italian. Um, you, uh, you grew up in Italy. Uh, what is, what's the space lore in Italy? Abby and I uh, grew up in the United States where... Uh, the our space program NASA is a point of national pride. Uh, what, what's that like in in Europe and and Italy in particular? So in Italy we do have an Italian space agency. I have uh, that that actually sponsors me. I'm, uh, I have it here. One of my patches. Uh, the Italian space agency is uh, is much smaller than the NASA, obviously, uh, and it is part of the European Space Agency. All the 
all the European space agencies can sort of work together with the European Space Agency, and especially for what regards human spaceflight, because all the astronauts belong to the European Astronaut Corps. Uh, in Italy, we had the first astronaut fly early in the 80s with a, with a shuttle flight. Uh, his name is Franco Manerba, he was a mission specialist. And then through the years, we had about, about every five to five to ten years, we had an astronaut going up either on the shuttle mostly as mission specialist. Um, so I am the sixth astronaut to, to, to go up in, in orbit. Uh, the last one before me, Paolo Nespoli, he went up on the space station for the, for the first time on a six-month mission. And I am the first one to fly a six-month mission that is fully, fully Italian. My, 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 my mission, my slot, was uh, obtained by the Italian Space Agency because the Italian Space Agency is one of the main contributors to the space station. I uh, one, one thing I like to highlight, it, it, sounds, it sounds funny, but about 40% of the volume of the space station was built in Italy. So it's mm -hmm. sort of a record for us. You know, such a small country to have to have contributed so much. What do you know about people from other parts of the world? We have someone watching us in Lagos, Nigeria, uh, who says, you know, how can an aspiring astronaut from this part of the world, Africa, have the opportunity to realize uh, his dreams? Um, are, are there opportunities for people, you know, outside of um, uh, Europe and uh, and the United States? Um, what would the path be for someone from another part of the world? It's certainly not as easy if your country doesn't have a space agency that cooperates with, uh, uh, for, with the International Space Station. And as a matter of fact, to fly on the International Space Station, uh, you, your, your country needs to be a partner of the International Space Station. So we have five agencies, the European Space Agency, NASA, obviously, Roscosmos, which is the Russian Space Agency, Canadian Space Agency, and JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency. This consortium, is the one uh, whose astronaut can can fly up on the International Space Station. Okay. So that, that that sort of limits the, the possibilities unless you have a dual citizenship with with another country. Uh, so um, I'm not I'm not saying it's easy. Actually, I'm saying that, that it's really hard. It doesn't make a difference. It's still worth doing. Most of, most things worth doing are usually very hard. But the good thing about this is that. A lot of a lot of countries uh, are looking at space as um, as a as a place where technology and innovation happens, and so we certainly think that in the future we'll have more and more countries uh, joining the, the space race, uh, even though it's not a race anymore. But joining the, uh, the space exploration efforts at an international level, certainly we are looking at India, China uh, already has done a lot of steps. Uh, Brazil will certainly be one of the, the the protagonist in, in the upcoming years. So all, all these all these countries will, will will come in and join us. And let, let's not forget that future exploration, especially when we talk about interplanetary exploration, going away from Earth, it will be a global effort. It will be uh, yeah. countries from all over the world uniting to to do this. Uh, I want to talk about you know, one of the next huge projects. Uh, and, uh, and that is Mars. And uh, Abby, do I understand it right that uh, you don't just want to go to Mars, you actually plan to go to Mars. Tell me about that ambition of yours. Um, yes, I want to be the first astronaut to Mars. And the reason that I want this is because Mars has always been something that's just kind of drawn my curiosity. As I said earlier, I'm really interested in biology and geology. And... Um, as I got older with this dream of being an astronaut uh, and started thinking more about space and researching more about space, Mars really popped out as me as something that I would be interested in because uh, there's, it's often considered um, almost a sister planet to Earth. Um, and I think that the similar and different geological features there are really interesting as well as the possibility of past or current life. Um, so those are two big reasons that I want to go and explore Mars, but I think the biggest reason is really just curiosity and interest, that it's something that's always there in the night sky and um, close enough that we could actually do something about it. Would you like to go and live on Mars, or would you like to go visit, study, and then come back and share what you learned? Um, 
I would consider either option really depending on what the circumstances provided at the time were. That's uh, either way. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of talk these days about, yeah, we can send people there, but we're not quite sure how to get them back. Uh, but it's probably possible, as Luca was saying before, with the right combination of you know builders and scientists to actually create a place where, where people could live for a long time on Mars. Uh, do you follow that that news and that discussion about Mars? Yeah, I do, and um, I think there is definitely the possibility and the ability both to get to Mars and to set up a, a colony type thing there. Um, but I also think that as humans, we should keep in mind that it would have to be rather minimal in order to not mar the natural uh, geological features of Mars, which is the reason that we'd be going there in the first place to study them. We don't want to end up having a uh, large impact that would change things too much. Um, but I do think that it's possible, and I think that that's definitely something that will happen in the near almost future. All right, Luca, I got to ask you, you get to go to the International Space Station, which is awesome, but Mars, man, do you want to go there next? <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't because then, you know, uh, then... Abby wouldn't be able to be the first one on, on Mars. So. Oh, yeah. No, if we got to pick between you two, I'm totally picking Abby. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it, man. But that's why I'm mentoring her. Because I'll tell you what. I love the fact that she sees herself uh, there in, uh, you know, in 20 years. It's, uh, it's awesome because uh, I think I, I was telling people that I'd be an astronaut since I was like three years old. And so the fact that, she, that she's already seeing herself there, and it's, um, that's exactly the right the attitude that I've that I, that I would want to see people having. So um, it's, I, I, think, I think it's great. And uh, uh, I'd go to Mars. I certainly would. People say uh, that, you know what, we should, including some former astronauts, you know what, we should go to the moon. We should set our sights on something closer to home. D do you have a thought on, on that, Luca, whether the moon or Mars should be the next place we go? Let, let me put it this way. It's... Uh, it's very simple. We leaving our planet and, and going and going beyond uh, going beyond our Earth orbit through the Moon via Mars via an asteroid. It's it's not something that we would like to do, or it's, it's not something that be that be neat or uh, you know at the next step. It's something that we must do. It's uh, for several reasons. The one reason is that it's just our nature. We, we, as humans, we, we ask questions. You're asking all these questions tonight because you're curious. We are all curious. We, we, we want to know answers to questions that we have and that, that, that whose answers we, we don't have. And so uh, going, going out there and find those answers is just our nature. I call it the uh, Ulysses uh, um, a gene. It's in our DNA. It's what makes us humans. So uh, that's what's important to me. Uh, going to the moon first going back to the moon and, and, and start a colony there before we move on, sure. Uh, going to an asteroid first and make sure that we know how to, uh, to develop that technology, sure. Going to Mars, not coming back, it doesn't matter. It will happen. It's just uh, it's something that, we, that we're going to have to do. All right. I want to ask uh, a pair of questions from uh, brothers in Oak Park, Illinois. Toby and Will uh, are uh, our brothers. And they each have questions for you. Will is trying to stump you guys with this question: How far away are the stars? And I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna put that on on you, Luca, because uh, you probably haven't taken out your tape measure uh, recently on that one. But uh, uh, Toby, we've got some. Uh, we'll post an answer to that in our live chat. Uh, the best we could tell, the uh, the closest star, uh, other than the sun, which of course is a star. Um, is about four light years away, so it would take about 50,000 years to get there using a modern spaceship. Um, that's the Alpha of the constellation of Centauri, if I'm not wrong. Uh, so that's how far away the stars are. Um, and Will's nine-year-old brother, Toby, asked this question, is zero gravity fun? Now, I know that neither of you have been in space yet, uh, but have either of you experienced zero gravity? Um, Abby, Abby probably hasn't had the chance to do that yet. That's not a course in, in high school yet. Not quite. The occasional time when you trip down the stairs, but otherwise, no. 
<laughs> but you use it as a learning experience, and that's what matters. Luca, how much time have you spent in zero gravity? I read about uh, a total of uh, 36 parabolas on, a, on an airplane that's normally not usually called the vomit comet. Uh, the, the vomit comet. Let me just stress that it's an airplane that goes up very high in the sky and then dives down to the ground. Uh, hopefully not to the ground. What it does, it does a, it does a series of parabolas where it goes up like a roller coaster, and then on the on the phase where it's going um, on the top of the parabola, it's actually that's that's when you experience uh, zero g, and they last about thirty seconds. And the pilots actually are so good that they can they can imitate zero g or lunar gravity or Mars Martian gravity, and I had the, the opportunity to try all of them. And let me let me answer the the little brother there that it's it's just as fun. It's a blast. It's even though you're on something called the vomit comet, you have a blast in zero gravity. I would I would go up on the vomit comet every day if I could. Well, you're about to get a chance to be in that environment at literally every day for, uh, for six months. Um, that's, that's exactly right. And, and is that, because I, what, what I love about Toby's question is he talks about fun and you're having fun. Do you think, I mean, I know your trip is going to be hard work, uh, but are you going to have fun in the International Space Station? So I'm sure that Toby, uh, as most American kids, uh, does uh, practice sport of, of sorts, uh, the football, baseball, basketball, swimming, I don't know, probably all of them. And, and those things are hard to do. They don't come easy. I mean, you can be a great swimmer, but you still need to, to, to work. I know Abby, Abby is a gymnast, and she spends a lot of time in the gym practicing. And that's hard work. But isn't it fun? Don't we do it because it's fun? So I, it's the same answers as before. When we love what we do, it's, it's fun. Even the challenges are fun. Even... Even just being able to overcome those challenges is part of what makes it fun. Abby, I know that you've talked to a lot of, of astronauts and people involved in the space program. Uh, do you get the sense that they're having fun? Definitely. Um, every time that I talk to a NASA employee, and I just say NASA employee because those are the people I've had the most contact with, but I really think that this goes for um, everyone who's involved in the space program. Absolutely. Uh, that they love their jobs. They love what they do. Even if they're not the astronauts, their jobs are really amazing and interesting. And the reason that they're in them, they're the best of the best people doing these jobs, the rocket scientists. And the reason they're there is because they want to be there, because they enjoy what they do. And um, so, yeah, I definitely get that sense. Uh, so now I want to switch that around. What is, what's the most difficult part? Luca, you've been training for this mission for a long time now, uh, and I'm sure there's parts that aren't fun and parts that are actually really hard for you. Can you, can you share with us what's difficult? Well, uh, again, I would have put it as much as uh, not fun or difficult. It's what's more challenging, and, that, and everybody is different in that sense. I'll give you a few examples of things that, that were really hard and that, that we just had to, to make do, uh, me and together with my classmates uh, when we were selected. We had about three months to learn Russian to a level good enough to, uh, to, to be assigned to a mission. So Russian is a, is a particularly complicated language, I have to say. Uh, I, speak, I speak four languages and Russian is by far the hardest I, I've ever studied. Uh, and, 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 you know, in three months, it's just, it's just not a lot of time to learn a language. So uh, that was certainly challenging. It was, it was a lot of, of hard work. We were uh, in a full immersion for, for three months of our lives, so, again, away from our families and, and from, our, from our homes, uh, you know, in a small town in Germany and then in St. Petersburg. Uh, another thing that I – you have a question? Well, you mentioned language. I did want to want to uh, get to that. Uh, that's difficult. That's you know that's different from the science and math that we're talking about. Um, when you're on the International Space Station, you're going to be with, uh, am I correct, a Russian and an American? Um, and uh, what language will you all speak when you're up there? So, as a matter of fact, we'll, on the station, the nominal crew is six people. So we will we will join three astronauts that will be already on the station. They are already up there, as a matter of fact. It will be uh, Chris Cassidy uh, from the NASA Corps, and then uh, Alexander Mizurkin and Pavel Vinogradov from the Russian 
astronaut corps. Uh, and then we'll, we will join them and there will be six people on the station. So the official language on the space station is English, but uh, we always joke with the other cosmonauts that what we actually speak is called Ranglish, and it's this mixture of uh, Russian and English because as always in the international environment, we, we go from one language to the other, uh, often according to the situation, according to what we're doing, even sharing food uh, would be one of those occasions. So, uh, Abby, are you practicing languages at this point? That's going to be something that's more and more important as uh, space exploration becomes an international endeavor. Um, yeah, Jeff, I take Chinese at my high school, which the reason that I chose to take Chinese was because, like we mentioned earlier, I really think that um, China is up and coming in the space community and that they will definitely be a part of endeavors in the future. And having that basis of communication is important. And I've also been planning on, um, it's not going to happen before I go on the trip to Russia, but on starting to take Russian because that's another one of those languages that is just vital if you want to enter this occupation. Uh, so now you just mentioned that you're going to take a trip to Russia. Uh, Luca blasts off next month. And Abby, you get to be there. You actually get to watch the Soyuz uh, rocket go up into space. Uh, tell us about what you're going to be doing while you're there. Um, what we're going to be doing while we're there is that we're going to arrive uh, two weeks early and we're going to spend one week in Moscow um, with all the other NASA people who have been invited and who are going. And we're going to be exploring and discovering the culture um, there. And then we're going to spend one week in Kazakhstan in Baikonur, which is where the lodge site is. Um, and I'm really looking forward to, while we're in Baikonur, to getting to see what happens, what gets put together to create a launch like this. All the people who are involved, all the people and the facilities and the engineering that's involved. Um, so I'm just really looking forward to having that firsthand view of how this happens. And, and Luca, you'll be there too, but uh, do I understand correctly, you guys won't be able to hang out together because at some point you go into quarantine. Tell that us about correct. that experience briefly. So I already had the chance to experience it as a, as a backup. Last December I was in Baikonur uh, being in quarantine together with the Prime crew that uh, left in December and who's already up there right now. So quarantine is a, it's a very peaceful time. It's uh, uh, it's done on purpose to to let the astronauts sort of get away from from all the craziness of what happens before launch, mm -hmm. and and to stay isolated and think about you know solve the the last uh, the, the last problems, uh, record the last messages before before blasting off into space, and it's a it's a it's a very neat time where you get to spend time with the other astronauts, the rest of the team, all the people that work with you, your instructors, your doctors, and then. Unfortunately, you don't get to spend time with your guests, uh, unless, uh, except for your close family, who goes to a special, special medical uh, uh, profile in order to, to spend time with you. And because the, the idea is, uh, if you're hanging out with Abby the day before you launch, and Abby brings a nasty cold from the United States, you're going to bring that uh, in uh, in the rocket into the space station, and uh, we really don't want sick people uh, you know, catching things from each other up in space, right? Yeah, you can blame it on the bad weather in Minnesota right now. <laughs> and we do. We blame everything on the bad weather in Minnesota right now. But that, that raises a question from uh, Chloe and Claire, uh, uh, are part of our Public Insight Network. They're nine years old and five years old, respectively, and they're in North Carolina. And they simply asked, what does an astronaut do uh, if they get sick in space? We do the same thing that you do on the ground. We just... We just wait until it goes away. <laughs> we have a, uh, on the station, unless you have a, a medical doctor on board, uh, which I will have in the last part of my, in the, in the last uh, six weeks of my, of my expedition, I will have two doctors on board. Mm -hmm. But for the first four and a half months, there are no doctors on board. So as a matter of fact, I, I am qualified as a crew medical officer, which means that I have been trained for the past three years to take care of small problems uh, on myself and, and my and my colleagues, I, I feel really sorry for them if I have to do that. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, <laughs> but you know, we are trained. You become the doctor either for yourself or for that, someone else. That is correct. That is correct. So I'm, I'm trained in doing IVs on uh, 
to s small small things like uh, suture or uh, to pull a tooth. But mostly, what we would do is uh, we we you know we talk to the guys on the ground, to the doctors, and they will guide us and recommend uh, medicines. We have a, we have a, a small pharmacy on the station that that we can yeah. you know we, we can use to. For, for for normal things, you know, astronauts tend to be pretty healthy people, so it's not something that happens very often. But that's an important thing for all the people asking, what do I need to do to become an astronaut? One of the answers is uh, get in shape, stay healthy, uh, figure out how to treat your body well. Absolutely, absolutely. That is absolutely. Uh, and, and Abby, is that something that you're spending time doing? You're worrying about your, your physical health already? I wouldn't put it so much as worrying as just... <laughs> maintaining because um as a teenager i already have fairly good physical health but uh as a teenager i'm also inclined to eat junk food and do things like that and be lazy so i'm <laughs> i'm working on not doing stuff like that and part of that is that i do do competitive gymnastics and so i'm in the gym 10 15 sometimes 20 hours a week so physical health is not really something i have to worry too much about because it's just a part of my lifestyle is that in the gym doing stuff or even outside in Minnesota when it's not uh, negative 20 degrees or so. <laughs> yeah. um, just being physically active and eating right. Yeah. We have just a few minutes left, you guys, and I want to get to a few more questions. So let's do kind of a lightning round uh, with just a short answer for some of these things. Mrs. Fine's fifth grade class uh, caught me in a question I should have asked earlier. You were talking about emailing each other from the International Space Station. Uh, Luca, how do you send an email from space? Don't you love technology? So we uh, we have a um, uh, it's actually through a, a radar uh, a band. It's uh, it's called a S band. It's part of the of, of the radar uh, bandwidth, and we use this bandwidth to send a message to a, a packet of messages to uh, to a satellite, and then a satellite relates it down to the ground, and through those. Those uh, satellites, we, we can upload and download all kinds of things. So you're uh, using radar signals and satellites to move to move text and uh, and pictures and information and commands to the station. Do you have the internet on the space station? We do. It's really slow, but we do have internet. <laughs> Um, a question for both of you. Again, quick answer. Are there particular books or authors that influenced your career choice? Abby, do you have a particular book? Um, science fiction in general. I love science fiction. My dad really loves science fiction. And so I was raised with like a lot of Star Wars and Star Trek and things like that in my life. Uh, and so I read a lot of books about people traveling through space and science fiction, that type of thing. So I just say that genre in general has really influenced me. Uh, Lucas, same question. That one is from Jen Willis, uh, who just asked, is there a book that inspired you? Or is there a book that you're going to take along for your free time while you're in space? Uh, for, the first, for, for the first question, I think I read every single book by Isaac Asimov. The, Isaac Asimov, uh, yeah. I, yes, I think I read every single book and single short story. I grew up on his books. I think he probably stays one of the fathers of science fiction in the world. Uh, there are other authors that I like. Uh, uh, Dan Simmons is an amazing uh, sci-fi author. Uh, Michael Crichton, uh, but but if I had to, to to mention one name, I think Asimov is certainly uh, the one that that, that uh, inspired me the most as a, as a kid or growing up. As for a book that I'm taking up on the station, I I am taking one. It's a bit of a surprise, so I, I, uh, that's uh, I cannot really say it out right now. But mm -hmm. but. I'm mostly taking it as a, as a souvenir rather than something I want to read because I promised myself, I actually asked Karen to slap me on the face every time she catches me doing something that I could do on the ground rather than while and, I'm on the and station. Karen, and Karen is one of your colleagues? That is correct. Karen is coming up on the station with me. She's like my big sister. <laughs> so if you can She's do just, it on the ground, you shouldn't be doing it in space. That is correct. So she should slap me every time she catches me doing that. Fair enough. We appreciate that. For those of us who aren't going up to space, we need you to have as much fun as you can while you're up there. Um, hey, I, Abby, I have a quick question for you. Uh, you know, we grew up watching the space shuttle go up into space, um, but now the, the shuttle program is over, and I think that, uh, you know, I'm imagining kids these days having a harder time picturing uh, 
what they'll be sitting in, what it will be like to travel into space. Um, has that changed your impression uh, of the future at all now that the shuttles are gone? Um, I'd say that's changed less my impression of the future than I would expect because I also grew up in that shuttle age and I'm not done growing up yet, but the majority of my child was in that shuttle age. Um, so that hasn't changed the way I look at it, but I do think that that changes the way that a lot of younger kids look at it because it's, it's hard to imagine what a Soyuz rocket, or even if a Soyuz rocket will be the future of the space program, we don't know what's going to happen. Right. We can make guesses, but we're really not sure. And so I, I do think that that is an uncertain thing that's kind of like, so makes it more difficult for people and for kids to get interested in space. Here's a question for you from, uh, from Molly in North Carolina that I don't think we've addressed yet. Is there part of the training uh, regime that Luca is going through uh, and that all astronauts have to go through, Abby, that you're really looking forward to? Is there a part of the training you just can't wait to get your hands on whenever that day might come? Yeah, the tests. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> has to take a lot of tests. And as a high schooler, I am feeling his pain with that also in a much less severe way. So what I'm actually looking forward to the most is the Vomit Comet, because I think that that is possibly the coolest invention ever. The idea that on Earth we can experience that feeling, and um, hearing Luca talk about it, I'm just like, ah, I want to do that so bad. <laughs> that would be it. Uh, a couple uh, classrooms have asked us, how old do you have to be to be an astronaut? And we talked a bit about ages before. Is there a particular age limit, Luca? Not really. As long as you're healthy and, uh, and, and you're qualified, you can be uh, young or old. You know, John Glenn went up when he was in his almost 80s or even older. And we had an astronaut, I think he was a, a payload specialist who was uh, barely 25 or 26 years old when he went up. Uh, a question from Victoria Fisher in Pittsburgh, um, who is asking you, Luca, what advice would you give your daughters or to other young girls if they want to become astronauts? I actually happen to have two daughters, two young daughters. Uh, I think right now they're more focused on becoming princesses than astronauts. But uh, again, I, I would never impose anything on them, and I just I would just tell them what I'm what I've been telling everybody, just do what you love uh, and make sure that, what, that, that you love what you do. Uh, Abby, you know, most of the astronauts who uh, have gone up in history have been men. Uh, what conversations have you had with astronauts and people in the space uh, industry about, you know, the, uh, about the place of women in the space program these days? Um, the conversations and what I've heard and discussed with people is that um, we're trying to step away from the idea of it being just women or just men or even uh, thinking about it as women or as men. We're scientists. Um, there's less of a gender bias or less of a gender specific reason why we should be considered um, the first woman to Mars, the first man to Mars. It's the first astronaut to Mars. And that's kind of the thing that I'm trying to portray with the wording that I choose to use sometimes, is that um, the best way that we can continue the amazing work that's been done in the past uh, uh, with the space program to increase the equality of the genders in the science fields and the astronaut field is to just stop thinking about it as women or men and start thinking about it as scientists, colleagues, astronauts. Um, stop using gender descriptive terms such as that. So that would be my personal take on it. Um, <laughs> That's right. uh, we are at 2 o'clock uh, central time here, and um, I want to thank you both so much for joining us. There's some questions we didn't get answers to. Uh, I want to encourage people uh, who have joined this chat and still have questions to fill out the form, um, the Public Insight Network query form. Let us know what questions you have, and uh, I'm hopeful that maybe Abby uh, and Luca could uh, could answer some more questions for you, and we'll try to get back to people uh, via email or via Twitter with some of the questions we didn't get to today. Uh, Luca, well, actually, they right? can they can if they if they have questions or, or curiosities or they want to know more about what's happening in orbit or about my my adventure in Abyss. Uh, I actually have a website. It's called uh, lucaparmitano.com. 
uh, that has links to all my activities, to my blog where I talk about my adventure, to my Twitter account where I answer questions that are posed directly to me, and to my Facebook page where I do the same thing. So uh, please feel free to contact me directly through these channels. I'm more than happy to answer questions. I think it's part of my mission as a matter of fact. Well, and uh, at our website, sciencenightmn.tumblr.com, we have links to uh, Luca's website and ways to contact him, as well as to Abby's website. And Abby, I know that you have a strong following and that you're doing a, a great service to, to young people these days uh, in, uh, in helping them realize uh, their dreams and uh, as they follow along with yours. Thank you, Jeff. Yes, I have a website. It's astronautabby.com, as well as a like Luca mentioned, all the social channels of Twitter, Facebook, um, basically all of them. And I'm always happy to answer questions and to uh, just talk to people about the dream and everything. That is Abigail Astronaut Abby Harrison. She's a 15-year-old aspiring astronaut who joined us today from Minneapolis. And uh, her mentor, Luca Parmitano is an astronaut with the European Space Agency. He'll be launching into space just next month, May 28th, a little more than one month from now. Luca, I want to wish you the very best of luck, best wishes, Godspeed in space. Uh, and Abby, I want to wish you good wishes for your trip to, uh, um, to Russia to watch Luca uh, blast off. And uh, I want to thank you both for spending time with me and with all the people who have been watching and following along with, with us today. Thank you. Thank you for, for uh, having me. If you're on our chat at sciencenightmn.tumblr.com, feel free to add any last thoughts or fill out our query form to join the Public Insight Network. And uh, join public, you can join the Public Insight Network at publicinsightnetwork.org anytime. Thank you for watching. Have a great day, everyone.